All right, once again, let me welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today to talk about Blue Prism mainframe integration and the guide that we have published on optimizing Blue Prism mainframe automations. I'm Jerry Rackley, Director of Marketing, and I'm joined by our presenter, Russ Tubner. And uh, Russ, if you would take us to the next slide. Uh, let me introduce Russ, and as I do that, let me also tell you that we would love to have your questions and your comments. So being uh, users of Zoom, we have some nice features to let you interact with us, and we hope that you will. So if you look at your panel at the bottom, you'll see there's a chat function. There's also a Q&A function. It doesn't really matter which one you choose to use. If you have some things you'd like to talk about, we'll monitor that during the course of our presentation today, and we will get to your questions. So. Please feel free to share your thoughts and your questions and your comments as we go through that. As I mentioned, I'm joined today by Russ Tudner, the CEO and co-founder of HostBridge. Russ, I'll let you say hi to everybody. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking a bit of time out of your day to um, discuss this topic. So we're going to go through some fairly technical information, and this is what it's based on. And Russ is actually the author of this guide. Uh, he'll take you through our journey, but a little over a year ago, we began interacting with our enterprise clients, and many of them were beginning to use uh, RPA. Some of them were fair, fairly deep into their implementations, and they asked us to get involved and to help them understand what is the impact that all this automation is having on the mainframe. And it turns out, in some cases, the impact was, was pretty significant. As a result of all these interactions with these enterprises that are using these platforms, we developed a series of guides. So the one you see on your screen is specific to Blue Prism. It's free. We have companion guides available for UiPath and Automation Anywhere. And of course, we have lots of expertise we're happy to share in general on how to make these automations that interact with CICS work much better and be more reliable. So if you'd like to get any of our resources, that link that you see on the page, hostbridge.com slash mainframe dash RPA dash resources, will take you to the web page where you can get all of those things. So what I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Russ and let him walk you through what we've learned about Blue Prism. But again, just one more, uh, suggestion. If you have comments or questions, we'd love to have them. Please use the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of the slide. And let me also say, we are recording this session. So you'll get an email afterwards that will have the link to the recording if you want to watch it again or if there are others you want to share this information with. All right, Russ, it's all yours. Great. Well, Jerry, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, as Jerry said, um, we, um, we've authored uh, this document uh, regarding Blue Prism. We also have companion documents related to UiPath and Automation Anywhere. Those three products in the RPA space um, tend to be kind of right now, at least now, they're considered the big three. Um, many, many large organizations are using one, actually in some cases, multiple of those and so we started having a, a number of our customers inquire about this, this impact. The first thing we did with, after customers began asking us about um, how can they do kind of some analytical impact analysis of RPA on the mainframe is we developed some analytic tools. I'll actually show you uh, that at the end of this presentation. But having gone through that exercise with a couple of our customers, we decided it was high time to, for us to really do a deep dive into Blue Prism, UiPath, and Automation Anywhere so that we can really help customers understand uh, how RPA platforms can impact the mainframe and how they can perhaps do it far more efficiently with a different approach. That's what we will highlight today. I suppose uh, 2020 will go down as a year that's very unique for many reasons for all of us. No doubt we're all, I'm sitting at my home office today doing this webcast. Uh, you may be too. Um, the first thing um, 
normally I travel quite a bit visiting with customers. And uh, during April of this year, obviously I wasn't doing any traveling. Um, instead, what I decided to do was just crack the books on Blue Prism, UiPath, and Automation Anywhere. And it was, and I spent a month just immersing myself in those products and exploring all the ways that that real world customers use them to interact with the mainframe application um, inventory and and then write these guides. So this is reasonably fresh material. We are active and on point uh, dealing, working with our customers today, helping them understand the impact of RPA on the mainframe and helping them find uh, more reliable and more performant ways to achieve that connection. Uh, let me just introduce a bit about HostBridge. Maybe some of you are familiar with us or not. Uh, we are a company that focuses on software and expertise uh, to make CICS applications available as callable services, period. That's who we are, that's what we do. We've been doing it um, for 20 plus years, helping large organizations <coughs> Uh, take their existing valuable applications that run on the mainframe under Kix and expose them as modern services or microservices. We are known for having pioneered an approach to do this that completely eradicates screen scraping. Won't go into that any farther than to say that, but that is uh, something that we're known for We've created patented technology around it. The bottom line is that when HostBridge is orchestrating the activity of a terminal-oriented or screen-oriented transaction, there are absolutely no references to row column values when that application uses BMS maps. Uh, also, there are no host application changes required, whether they are screen apps or business logic apps or whatever. And kind of our secret sauce here is that we exploit JavaScript running on the mainframe under the covers of Kix for simplicity. And by the way, it is all, all of our code is 100% zip enabled. All of this get, we think yields high performance, high fidelity integrations. Um, and then we augment that with our integration analytics offering. Okay, that was a lot of words. So let's get on to RPA and ask the question, well, what does any of that have to do with enterprise RPA? And we're going to get into that. But we're going to begin with this diagram with just a simple, uh, seemingly harmless bot over there on the left. Uh, well, we, for purpose of this presentation, we will imagine that it's a blue prism bot. But over here, we have a, a mainframe. And the question is, how are we, how is that bot going to interact with the mainframe? Um, now, in this diagram, we've positioned HostBridge there because we think, and, and we'll circle back to this, we think we offer a far more efficient way to make that happen. But let me show you how it happens out of the box with either Blue Prism, uh, UiPath, or Automation Anywhere. Essentially, this is the situation. Uh, Blue Prism, um, bots interact with IBM mainframe applications using terminal emulation and screen scraping. So a, the bot author, and I'll, I will actually walk through a bot in a minute, the guts of a bot, um, it, will, it will clamp on to a, a terminal emulation session on your, your server or your workstation. It will then um, extract, uh, send in keystrokes, or extract field, uh, field or, or areas on the screen in order to bring data back into the bot. But this is kind of the, the state of the art, so to speak, for RPA platforms and the way that they interact with uh, mainframe-based application, terminal emulation and screen scraping. Um, for those of you who have been around in the industry as long as some of us have, your ears and eye, your ears should be open, your eyes should be wide open, thinking that 
we are yet again at a point in history where there are things outside the mainframe seeking to integrate with or orchestrate activities on the mainframe through terminal emulation and screen scraping. Um, what's the impact of all this? Well, as Jerry alluded to, we had a customer uh, call us almost two years ago and said, hey, uh, Russ, something, something bad's going on here. Uh, can you come, come and see? And so I did. Um, and this is a very successful organization. Their business volume continues to grow really nicely. But here's what they were seeing. Their mainframe transaction load was just growing asymmetrically. Now, truth be told, we've seen this, this um, dynamic a number of times over the last few decades. We saw it actually in the client server uh, buildup, kind of in that, that era. We saw it in the PC era. We saw it in the mobility era. And yet again, we're seeing it in the RPA area. And that is, it's very easy to see in the RPA area. In fact, I'll show you an analytics dashboard in a few minutes that will make it painfully clear what's going on. But essentially, uh, at this organization, various forms of RPA, um, not necessarily just a formal RPA platform like Blue Prism, but that particular organization had a large number of Excel spreadsheets and Excel macros that were automating terminal oriented uh, screen transactions. And just due to the nature of the way that all those operations were taking place, mainframe transaction volume was going up asymmetrically to the actual underlying business volume and business value. So let's jump into talking about Blue Prism and we're gonna compare two approaches. The first method is we're going to use the Blue Prism application modeler, which is a component of Blue Prism, in conjunction with a 3270 emulator to orchestrate mainframe application interactions uh, directly from, from Blue Prism. Then we're going to use an alternative approach. Method two will be using our JavaScript engine running under Kix to implement that orchestration and then have Blue Prism simply invoke that API-based service via an HTTP request. Now, before I go any farther, let me, I'm gonna break out of here and I'm gonna show you the application that we're actually going to be using. <coughs> Jerry, just as a confirmation, do you see my 30, 3270 screen? I hope you do. Yes, we are seeing that screen, that lovely like green screen. Lovely green screen. So what you're looking at is a live view of um, our mainframe at Hostbridge. Um, what I'm going to do is log on to a CICS region called CICSA. Now, the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to show you exactly what the Blue Prism bot is going to do or the Hostbridge script is going to do, the, the piece of JavaScript. Uh, the first thing it's going to do is connect to the mainframe. Second thing it's going to do, it's going to get into a Kix region. It's then going to log on to that Kix region the way I am right now. And then we get a, a, the, the basic Kix clear screen. I'm then going to run an application called Trader. It's been around for decades. It's a sample app application distributed by IBM. And all this is, is just kind of a mythical share trading application. And there are a whopping four stocks that it, it can show you. And so what we're going to do through Blue Prism is imagine that, that we want to get the price of all four stocks. So we're going to go one for KC import export. We're going to go one for get a new real time quote. Then what Blue Prism will have to do is it will have to scrape certain areas off the screen, like what I'm highlighting here. Uh, I can get the number of shares held and that. And so what Blue Prism will do will be scraping those data, that data off the screen. Then it will have to, to press PF3 once, twice, and then it will say option two to get to the second company. 
Then we'll do one for real-time quote, go through the same screen scraping operations, PF3 two times. We're going to go to company three, option one, scrape, PF3, PF3, item four, option one, scrape, PF3, PF3. And then on the final screen, we're going to go PF3. We're going to clear the screen and we're going to log off. That I've, I've just illustrated exactly what we're going to have the bot do. So let's get back over to uh, the slides and let's start. Now, um, with each of these uh, platforms, Blue Prism, UiPath, Automation Anywhere, whatever, the first challenge is just kind of understanding their vocabulary and their and and kind of the the overall metaphor. Now, Blue Prism um, has a very what I would almost say an engineering oriented uh, kind of um, metaphor to it. Um, it, is, it is, as we'll see, everything happens, all the design work happens in Blue Prism through a very rigid, but, um, but you know, uh, complete flow charting technique. And we'll begin to see that. Um, but when you open Blue Prism for the first time, you, you just, you're, you're kind of, it, it, you kind of have to catch your breath for a minute to try to figure out, okay, where do I start? Now, by the way, if you're new to Blue Prism and your organization uses Blue Prism, I hope you've discovered that there are some really good videos out on YouTube that, and they were in fact my learning pathway to really get a jump start on, uh, on Blue Prism. Um, but the key to understand in with Blue Prism is that what you're doing at the top level is you're creating objects. So as you can see, I have created here, or I, we are going to create this, an object called the Trader app, a direct via Blue Prism. So we're, that's, that's the name of the object. Now, once I've created the object, then I enter the, the uh, object studio, and this is where the flow charting begins. And um, I've highlighted on the left pane, all of the various action uh, items uh, that you can drag onto the flowcharting palette. Then at the top, I've, I've highlighted the application modeler. Those are the two areas that you're going to be bouncing back in between, or between the object studio with the drawing and the application modeler. And we'll go to the modeler in a minute. But as you can see, this, um, I, hope you, I hope it shows up okay on your screen. Um, and these, these flowcharts get fairly dense quick. Uh, but obviously we have a start node. The very first thing we're going to do is launch the emulator. And then that second one says we're going to wait for the VTAM logon screen. And then we're going to go down. If it's successful, we're going to send the VTAM application ID. If it's unsuccessful, we're going to bail out on that leg to the right if there's a timeout. After we send the VTAM application ID, we then wait for the kick sign on screen. Then that last uh, one that you can see there or next to last is we're going to type the credentials and then we're going to send an enter key. So the flow chart, as you can already tell, uh, has a lot of data in it. Now, I, I'm just going to show this to you. I, I don't imagine you can actually read that on your screen, but that is the flow chart for the work process that we're going to do. So I kind of painstakingly, you know, created all those things. Uh, we encapsulated the use of the actual interaction with the, you know, kind of the loop of interacting through those screens in one little object. Uh, then as we're gathering that data, we load it into what Blue Prism refers to as a table collection. And that's where we're gathering the information that's being scraped off these screens. But again, what we're seeing, what we've seen thus far, uh, kind of, the, and it's easier to read that the section in the middle is just uh, a portion of really what's going on here. Now, uh, again, it 
to do all this, um, it, it takes hours. So we're, we're not even going to be able to touch really kind of a lot of the hands-on methodology of doing this. But as I mentioned, there are two principles to understand with Blue Prism. One is this whole idea of flow charting um, in the object uh, palette. But then secondly, the application modeler. Uh, that is absolutely key. That is your, think of it as your gateway component to the mainframe. And so let's, ex let's kind of go into this application modeler because it's really critical uh, to understand. So the application modeler uh, will then, uh, you know, has a number of attributes and properties that you have to set up. What we're doing here is we are identifying the pathway to our emulator. For this, for this demonstration or for this project, I used IBM's PCOM. I had to give a session identifier. I have to give some, some fairly arcane uh, metrics here, like polling intervals and timeout intervals and, and things like that. But the key thing to remember, and we'll highlight it in a minute, is that unlike UiPath and um, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism does not have an integrated uh, emulator or a TN3270 client um, as part of the product. So you, you really do have to have a separate um, emulator package running on the PC um, on which you design this process. Um, but anyway, as we begin to create um, an application, we're going to find a new model. We're going to call this the Trader app. Uh, we're going to denote that this is uh, a mainframe application, and you can see that they support four other kinds of applications, Windows apps, Java apps, and then browser-based apps, depending upon the browser. So um, the, a key point here is that regardless of whether it's a mainframe app or a Windows app or a browser app, you're going to be using the application modeler as your kind of portal into any external application outside of Blue Prism. Uh, if you say it's mainframe, then I'm going to have to pick which uh, emulator I want to use. I'm not sure what you do if yours is not listed here, but since I had IBM PCOM, um, it worked great. Uh, just um, not, to, not to go into too many details, I'm not sure why, but I had far better success using the COM API interface to PCOM from Blue Prism than I did the Halopi interface. So uh, that's what we used. Um, obviously, I have to identify the emulator. I have to define lots of, of attributes as we indicated, things like polling intervals and timeout intervals. And then I have to specify a mode of the application the only one I could really get to work well was this embedded option. And so uh, since I was about trying to get a quick win here, that's what I used. Um, and then um, the, the, there was this other option here. I have no idea what this is for, but I, I didn't enter anything there. At the end of the day, you end up with this defined session. And now once you have a session defined, you can actually begin to define screens. Now, you'll notice that underneath that trader app, I have defined a number of dependent elements in this app, and that's what you do. So, for example, I've defined an element called VTAM selection screen, and then I must define what that is. So here it says VTAM selection screen. It's, an, it's a field element. It is a text field, and it has these attributes. It, um, the ending X coordinate is um, column 36. The ending Y coordinate is 21. In other words, you literally have to say where these things begin and end. And these values here, you know, the, the, the starting X, the starting Y, the ending X, the ending Y, and this text, choose from the following commands, is literally 
what you see when you look at that screen. In other words, that area right there that I'm highlighting is the area that I'm defining in that element or field in Blue Prism. So again, this is fairly detailed work. Now, th there are a couple of shortcuts to be able to define these fields. You can, in fact, do it manually, and in some cases, you have to. But there is a feature within Blue Prism that um, lets you define application elements and fields using kind of uh, and I, what they call their identification tool or a spy tool. And when you go into the spy tool, essentially what you're going to see is this. Um, it will lay a grid over your terminal emulation session. And, and then by using, you know, uh, coming up here and then kind of denoting or grabbing a, uh, a section of of those cells, you are essentially uh, um, denoting the starting X, the starting Y, the ending X, and the ending Y. In other words, you, it's a it's a graphical um, way to try to annotate these fields on the screen. Now, personally, I I found it to be a bit of a toss up as to whether this made me more productive or not, simply because uh, trying to, it, I spent a fair amount of time trying to get the grid just to line up over the emulator window correctly. And it turned out that it's really, really important that you have not set your windows um, zoom factor to any value other than 100%. In other words, I have a big screen. I normally have windows to, I normally tell Windows to increase the size of everything to 125%. That turned out to be a really bad idea uh, when you're using this spy grid approach because the grid wouldn't line up with the screen. So this is, um, I would say, th this is not something that I envision, um, you know, business end users doing. Um, this is going to be done by someone who really um, enjoys getting their hands dirty and enjoys uh, working with the details um, of a product like Blue Prism. So, but that's how, that's how you model the screen. So let's just kind of summarize. Um, the process to actually create this is extensive uh, to completely capture all the flows and the navigations for the transaction sequence. Um, the, and and the, this general approach of trying to use flow charting as to eliminate coding um, almost becomes a, a bit cumbersome here. Uh, obviously, to do all that, we only had to use flow charts and things like that. But we had to really uh, understand that mainframe application well. We really had to understand, you know, the X and the Y coordinates and for things on the screen. Uh, and became pretty involved. And um, I would say that the amount of, uh, again, I, it took hours to kind of get this right. And I know, I know mainframes pretty well, and I know that application very well. And I spent a lot of time bouncing back and forth between the object studio and the application modeler. So if you're a Blue Prism customer and you're just getting into mainframe integration, just be patient um, if you're going to use their uh, their approach, at least the one out of the box. Now, when it was all said and done, once we got, I got the bot ready to run and we ran the bot, we could do all of those interactions. And there were about, I don't know, you saw me do it, maybe about 20, 22 interactions. It took uh, the bot completed in 10 seconds. Now, that seems like a long time uh, to, to do 20 things, but actually of the three um, RPA platforms that we have uh, described in our various guides, 10 seconds is the winner. Uh, they range from 10 seconds as the low all the way up to about 60 seconds. So RPA platforms 
don't tend to do the work uh, quickly, uh, but once you get them set up right, they will do it uh, repeatedly. Let's look at another way to do it. Now, let's start with a, an understanding that Blue Prism, as do as with all other uh, RPA platforms, they can easily send an HTTP request anywhere. That's just part and parcel of what they are designed to do. And so given that at HostBridge, we create a product that runs on the mainframe under Kix and interacts with that same mainframe application without screen scraping. Um, and we let you interact or let you invoke that service via HTTP, it really is a perfect fit. So what we did was we, I created a, a flow chart. There's the start node in Blue Prism. Then I create a node uh, that just simply says, send the HTTP request to HBJS. And then it will, it'll gather back the JSON document in the HTTP result. Then we'll use the second step uh, called JSON to collection, and that is a component within Blue Prism that will disassemble a JSON document and automatically create or move it into an HTTP collection document. Those two um, trapezoid shaped items on the right, those are data structures. One's called uh, the HTTP result. That's where the output goes into that data structure. And then that HTTP collection will be the data structure that holds the output that is then um, uh, or extracted from the, the output JSON document. You can see though, that from a Blue Prism standpoint, instead of having the big long flow chart on the right side of this slide, where, where the designer hat or the developer has to know every particular detail of what's going on. What we do instead with this approach is we just provide the Blue Prism um, developer with the specification of the API request. All they do is just send the HTTP request to the mainframe, get back the results, life goes on. Now, um, obviously there's a lot of interest in maybe wondering, well, okay, how do you write that JavaScript? We have a whole separate learning pathway about that, a different um, WebEx that we do quite frequently uh, to help customers see this. But this is just standard JavaScript. You're gonna write a bit of JavaScript and given that JavaScript is probably the most widely known language on planet Earth, um, it, it's not hard for any of us to look at this and to see what we're doing. Um, note that there are absolutely no references in any of what you see here to rows and columns. Instead, if I want to get the value of, of a field, such as the number of shares held or the value of those shares, I simply reference the BMS map name variable. That's the magic connection. It happens dynamically and in real time. And so there is absolutely no binding between the JavaScript and the 3270 terminal oriented application. It, it, so there's no row column references provided. It's a BMS application, which in our experience, most are. We have ways to deal with it if they're not. You can change, you can rearrange every field on the screen. Um, and as long as the field names are the same, the integration will not break. However, if you change any, any of those fields that, that a screen scraping um, bot relies on even one cell, it will most likely break. Um, so we think that's a tremendous argument for using this approach where, there, <clears throat> where the likelihood of breakage um, is minimized. Um, let me walk through just a little bit how we do this through Blue Prism. Uh, if I want to invoke a script and specify that, that uh, action, 
I'm simply going to create um, or, or create what they call an action property. I'm going to say I want it to be an HTTP action. I'm then going to say more specifically, it's an HTTP request. And then I'm going to fill out the attributes of that request. Most particularly, I'm going to give it the address URL. I'm going to say it's going to be a GET request and provide some credentials. In this case, we're going to our demo system. And so it's just demo and demo. Then we're going to invoke that script through that URL. What, that's, what that URL is saying is that obviously we're going to um, a Kix region on our mainframe. We're going to a script named live demo. That script was written to accept a variable called companies. And we're going to say we want uh, data for all four companies. And then we're going to say uh, type equal JSON, which just says we want the output in JSON. You could also say XML if you wanted. Now, it, it's important probably to know we don't set rules as to the names of scripts, the values of your inputs and outputs. These were just choices that we made uh, to make a very simple demonstration application. Once we've specified our inputs, we're then going to uh, tell Blue Prism what to do with the output. We're going to say, take the result, uh, consider it to be text, and store it in um, a, a data structure called HTTP result. Once we run that, we can then actually look and see what came back. And sure enough, after we run the bot, the current value is, is exactly what you see, see there highlighted, a JSON document with all of that same information that came from uh, the trader application through HBJS. Then I am going to translate that JSON document to a collection. That's very straightforward in Blue Prism. And you end up, um, you're done. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. Uh, that little flow chart that had those two nodes uh, to invoke the trader uh, script on the mainframe ran the exact same transaction sequence and our response time was 201 milliseconds. Now again, so just for, for comparisons, we sent a single request to the mainframe uh, in order to do the, the orchestration or run those transactions under the covers of the mainframe at memory to memory speeds and it took 201 milliseconds. When we orchestrated that from Blue Prism, from that long flowchart we created, it took 10 seconds. So why the disparity? Well, it really just boils down to just kind of um, the, the plumbing involved here. And that is that when you're using a bot, a platform, an RPA platform, and you're going against applications um, on a one-by-one on a -one basis, you're going to end up running in some, we ran only 18 to 20, but I'll show you cases in a minute of, of bots that run hundreds and thousands of transactions. And it's not hard at all to understand from that, that efficiency is low, latency is high, so you got some cases very high, and that the overall cost model of this sort of arrangement is very high. Contrast that with this, where we had the, the other, the method two, this is what we just described with Hostbridge, and that is you take the RPA bot, it just sends a single HTTP request in, our arrestful service is kicked off, it interacts with any CICS artifacts, whether they're screen-based, transactions, com area programs, DB2, vSAM, whatever, you can touch any of those from that JavaScript service running under Kix, and then we send back a single response. So it's just no mystery whatsoever that if we're trading, you know, dozens of calls for one call, the efficiency goes up, the latency drops to the floor, and the overall cost also goes down. So this is our comparison. When you use 
Um, terminal emulation and screen scraping from an RPA platform to go to integrate with your mainframe. Um, the performance is worse. You should expect that. The, we, we grade the resilience uh, if you're using terminal emulation as brittle, some cases very brittle. And that's because if you change virtually anything about that application, and in some cases, even the timing from screen to screen, the bot will break. However, when you're doing that, that orchestration, that integration on the mainframe, it's extremely resilient because you are not subject to all of those timing vagaries. You're not subject to row column issues. The, the script is, the, or the process is far more uh, robust and resilient. The implementation, uh, we think when you're using terminal emulation from RPA, it can be pretty complex because the person actually creating that flowchart or that bot designing it, they really have to be involved in a lot of the dirty details of the mainframe application. Whereas if, if you just provide them with a restful service, it's simple. It's just really, really simple. Uh, from a mainframe impact, uh, we grade out terminal emulation as being moderate to high, whereas with a restful service, it's low to moderate. Now, bear in mind, in the, in, in the solution we just showed, where we used both Blue Prism to interact with the mainframe directly or Blue Prism to run a host bridge service, we ran the exact same transactions. But remember, when we did it, when we used Blue Prism um, to, to interact using terminal emulation and screen scraping, we had to have all those individual interactions with the mainframe and with Kicks, And those, th th they're not necessarily expensive in and of themselves, but in aggregate and at production volume, they can become costly. And the trade-off here is with a RESTful service running on the mainframe, you're simply sending one request in. The work is performed and then one response comes out. And that's what mitigates the impact. So our recommendation is for existing automations uh, complete what we call a mainframe RPA analysis. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and that'll help you understand the impact of your existing automations and uh, identify high priority automations that you should optimize. And our recommendation is for new automations, uh, consider uh, some kind of a RESTful service, some kind of an API-based service, um, as the boundary between the RPA platform like Blue Prism and your mainframe. Um, and we hope you would look at us, but even if you don't, <clears throat> my, my advice would be the same. Don't, I mean, find a way. If you're, if you're doing production level work at scale, at volume, uh, please look for a way to not use, to avoid emulation and screen scraping as the integration technique from the RPA platform to the mainframe. Let's talk about, uh, sh switch gears here. We have a few minutes left. Let me talk about our RPA analysis uh, effort. This is kind of a separate part of the things we do with HostBridge. It has nothing to do necessarily with uh, what many people have known us for, which is our, all our work with our uh, integration engine. Uh, this whole product stemmed from our interaction with various customers who were struggling with RPA activities. And so we created a, uh, a very lightweight uh, methodology and product uh, that can take SMF 110 data, move it down to an analytics platform such as Splunk, which is what we're using here, and do some really interesting analytics on it. What you're showing or what you're seeing here is a small slice in time and this came from a real customer where there were 248, about a quarter of a million transactions run. Uh, we were able to deduce that 216,000 of them were executed via various RPAs. And you can see clearly uh, that from the diagram at the bottom that, that shows RPA activity versus human activity that the bots 
are winning. We also then developed some technology to be able to uh, analyze the DNA of these bots. Uh, and the purpose of DNA analysis is so that maybe a subject matter expert can look at the DNA of the bot and maybe have an aha moment, as in, uh, you know, why are they doing it that way? Or maybe, maybe the end user doesn't know that they don't need to do it this way at all. For example, look at that first line right there. So we detected a bot at a given, and it ran for, let's see, a duration of uh, six, almost 600 seconds. It ran for 10 minutes. It ran a total of 6,746 transactions. It chewed up 14 CPU seconds. This is a big mainframe. That's a lot of time. I, um, and what it did, you can see I've highlighted the stats there, but look to the right at the DNA column. It ran the menu transaction once, and it ran the catalog transaction 6,745 times. <clears throat> we showed this to the subject matter expert. And he said, oh, I know what they're doing. They're screen scraping the, the, the catalog application. And at the beginning of a day, or, or in order to have their own private version of the catalog that they'll use in an Excel spreadsheet throughout the course of their day. In other words, Someone created a bot to screen scrape the mainframe application, load the data into Excel, so that then instead of interacting with the mainframe, they're now interacting with the spreadsheet. Um, the outcome of once, once the customer, you know, sorted all that out, they were pleased to inform the end user that that data was already sitting in an operational data store uh, and that they didn't need to run that bot at all. In other words, a, a user, an end user with the best of intentions sought to self solve a problem. They did it in a way that made sense to them, but unbeknownst to them, that same data was already sitting in a PDF file on the operational data store. And so as a result, all the people who had been running this bot throughout the organization no one were the information was conveyed please don't do this you don't need to run that bot and so they saved uh, almost 7,000 transactions um, for every time one of their salespeople through the course of a day uh, ran that bot um, I'm going to switch here uh, instead of belaboring maybe in uh, line two I want to show you since we have a few minutes left I want to show you what this actually looks like with some real data. Now, I'm. This is a, a more advanced version. This is um, what we call Analysis V5. Uh, we've we, we're continually including this or enhancing this for our customers. But uh, I just ran this for the webcast and uh, looking at a slice of data uh, from a customer on seven uh, July 28th. Uh, and we were just looking at a one hour slice just to see what we could find. And in this one hour slice, I mean, this is, this is real stuff here, by the way. <laughs> so here's a, here's an RPA bot. It ran 3,638 transactions. Um, it chewed up five seconds of CPU time and you can see the five transactions that it ran and here's the exact DNA. So it ran uh, the XTL transaction once, ran the catalog transaction four times, then menu. And then once it gets started, you can begin to see kind of the repeating factors here, that this transaction is bouncing from the menu to iHistory, to catalog, to XTL, to CTLG, and then it goes back again. Um, we can scroll down and we'll find other bots here. There's one bot right here, all it did was it ran the CTLG transaction um, 2631 times. Uh, and here's one that we see a lot, the kind of some of these repeating patterns where this is the transaction. I, I don't really know what these transactions are or do, but I 276, 79 and 81. And you can see that someone has written a bot that is just bouncing uh, between those 
trying to maybe perform some automated operation. Now, it's not hard to look at that and understand that there has got to be a better way to achieve effective, robust, and resilient integration to these to this good and valuable business logic running on the mainframe apart from doing terminal emulation and screen scraping thousands and thousands of times. By the way, in our work with our customers to date, we, we kind of keep track of, of who, what, what are the winners. And I'll just tell you that um, whereas this bot only ran uh, 3,600 transactions, the winner thus far of uh, the customers we worked with was a bot that ran slightly over 30,000 transactions. Um, and um, it, it, it was, it's quite the whale, as we would say. So let me switch back. Uh, that's a little, by the way, that's a little bit of what we do on our analytics practice. Um, if you would like for us to um, kind of show you your data through our analytics tool. It's really easy. Um, all you have to, you can call me, call Jerry, uh, send an email to Hostbridge. And what we do is we'll send you some instructions that will guide you to sending us maybe an hour or two of SMF 110 data off an active region of your system. We will load it into Splunk and we will run it through our RPA analysis and we'll schedule um, a web conference call with you. Uh, probably a week to 10 days later and show you what's going on under the covers of your system. So we're happy to do that. There's no, no cost to that. So let me just summarize here. Um, as mainframe RPA activity scales, it can have a negative impact on, on your mainframe operations. Um, and the reality is this impact is expensive and it's largely not well understood. In other words, this organization had no idea, um, apart from this dashboard, that I me, mean, I excuse me for switching screens. Um, they had no idea that these transactions, that these bots were in the field and that they were doing this sort of orchestration. So the purpose of the analytics tool is to be able to visualize that see it, assess the impact, and then solve uh, and find a more efficient way to do it. And finally, um, we, Hostbridge, have tools, services, and expertise and solutions uh, that will help you measure the impact of RPA activity with your mainframe and optimize the way it interacts in order to achieve um, higher performance and better resilience. I want to put one, make one final comment. Nothing about my comments today regarding Blue Prism or any RPA platform should be deemed to be negative about RPA in general. We think RPA platforms are good. We think they represent viable, useful, powerful uh, technology that is, that, is being, that is being deployed for good business benefit within organizations worldwide. However, interact or, or creating integrations between RPA platforms and a mainframe app, if you're going to do it at scale and for real production purposes, doing the integration on the basis of terminal emulation and screen scraping is a problem waiting to happen. You will, you, it, it's not, I mean, we, I think after the last two years of digging into this, we can say authoritatively, it is not the way to solve that problem. You need to create a, a, a more robust and resilient way, um, means of integration where the RPA platform interacts with the mainframe on the basis of an API implemented by something. We hope it's us, but regardless, uh, our, our bottom line is, if you're going to do, if, if you want to do, create bots that are going to run at scale and high volume, don't use terminal emulation and screen scraping. Jerry, I think I've said that like 20 times already. So I think I know it's time for me to stop and answer questions. 
Yes, indeed. Well, hopefully you all uh, found this helpful and we would love your comments or your questions either right now through the Q&A or chat function, or you can see the email address. There's Russ's contact information on your screen. Our general purpose email that's monitored by several of us is simply info at hostbridge.com. And we have a number of resources we're happy to make available, including just our expertise. If you just want to have a conversation about this, we'd love to do that. We can set up a Zoom call and walk through what your situation is and, and what your options might be regarding the things Russ has shared today. We also can talk to you about the analysis. If you can provide some SMF data, we can come back within a week or two and show you some things about how your mainframe is actually being impacted by automations and what, if anything, you can do about that. So we're happy to talk to you about that as well. So uh, if you have questions or comments, please share them either now or offline. I'll give you another minute if you're thinking through what you want to ask or how you might ask it. But as uh, we close out our session today, we do appreciate your time and attention. As you know, we're quite passionate about making sure that CICS integrations and orchestrations are high performing and resilient. That's what we do. And we uh, love the opportunity to work with enterprises who are trying to blend their automations with their mainframe. Well, it doesn't look like we have questions, so that's fine. Uh, but do let us know if you have things you'd like to share with us. We welcome your input. So thanks again, everyone, for watching. And we hope this was helpful. Have a great day, everyone.